afternoon. How is everybody doing today? I'm going to take that silence as a sign that you're all good and happy and have a full belly for all this wonderful food that we're eating today. Uh, I want to thank all of you uh, to the Leadership Columbia Alumni Association Leadership Extension Luncheon Series. Uh, my name is Allison Sullivan and I'm the chair-elect of Leadership Columbia Alumni Association for next year. Uh, Alan Bridgers is our current chair, but he has a sick little one and unfortunately couldn't be with us today. Um, but I know we hated to miss because we have some excellent programming lined up today. Uh, for those of you new to LCAA, uh, the mission of LCAA is to develop leaders in the Columbia area by providing leadership training, networking events, and volunteer opportunities for graduates of Leadership Columbia. What better way to highlight these goals than to hear from City Manager Teresa Wilson? We're excited to have Ms. Wilson with us today and look forward to hearing from her later in the program. Before we get into the program, I want to take a couple of minutes and recognize a couple of special guests today. This luncheon series for the entire year is presented again this year by Smoyer and Company. We'd like to thank Terry Smoyer and his guests for sponsoring this luncheon series. I'd also like to thank SCENG for sponsoring the head table today, and my law partners at Bluestein, Nichols, Thompson, and Delgado for also being a presenting sponsor of today's luncheon. We also welcome members of the Leadership Columbia class of 2015. Would those class members that are with us today please stand? Outstanding. Thank you guys for being here today. All right, a couple of housekeeping announcements before we get started. Uh, restrooms are located just outside of the room over here on the left. Uh, please take a moment if you've not already and silence your cell phones and put those on vibrate. And, uh, but other than that, you can use your cell phones if you want to get some social media trending and like this event on Twitter and Facebook and maybe live tweet it. That could be cool. All right, feel free to move your chairs around uh, if you need to get a better uh, view of the lectern here. And finally, door prizes will be given at the end of the program, and that will be handled by Ms. Natalie Cobb. Community service is a significant component of the Leadership Columbia program and something that we've been committed to for pretty much the entirety of the program. The LCAA's nonprofit spotlight promotes an outstanding nonprofit organization that serves our local community here in the Midlands area. We encourage our alumni to learn more about each organization featured during our nonprofit spotlight and find meaningful ways to become involved. Today, I'm excited that we are featuring the Association of the United States Army. Since 1950, the Association of the United States Army has worked to support all aspects of national security while advancing interests of America's Army and the men and women who serve. AUSA is a private nonprofit education organization that supports America's Army active National Guard Reserve, civilians, retirees, government civilians, wounded warriors, veterans, and family members. AUSA also provides numerous professional development opportunities at a variety of events, both local and national. Kevin Suedo is here on behalf of AUSA today to give a little more insight on what they do and how to get involved, particularly here in the Midlands community. Mr. Suedo was the Deputy Commanding Officer of the United States Army Training Center at Fort Jackson. He retired from the United States Army on February 1, 2011 with 20, 32 years of service. After retirement, he was appointed by Governor Haley to be, to be the Executive Director of the Department of Motor Vehicles in continuing his career of public service. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Suedo. Since she's been talking over there and everybody's fighting a poll, I'll talk from here if that's good with everybody. It makes it easier to see everybody. Number one, I want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to come and talk about AUSA. Number two, I am really, really, really familiar with your organization. I've loved it for a very long time. But I'm still the deputy commander at Fort Jackson. I was invited to talk to your organization several times. And I know what it means to the, the future of the city, the future of the state, to go ahead and build on inside the junior leaders to create a better South Carolina. So the official portion of this one has to begin, if you know what my roots are, it's a great day in South Carolina. <laughs> now, if you don't like that one, too bad time to leave because it's you that's making it that way. All right. I want to talk about AUSA. I've only got about three minutes, I'm told, to go ahead and talk. Um, this talk could really go for hours. 
and I'd be glad to talk to any of you collectively or individually about AUSA. So I've got to, if I've only got that short period of time, talk to you about the worst case scenario, because AUSA and the fort need your help. They need your help because whether you like it or not, Fort Jackson's mission is at risk. The soldiers uh, out there, some of their, uh, their incidentals are at risk. I'll start with the soldiers and then I'll go into the mission. And again, remember this is worst case because I don't have much time to talk. But at a soldier level, they're talking about now uh, you know, uh, stagnating their, their pay raises, but at the same time charging them for housing and charging them for certain pieces of health care, uh, removing benefits like the PX and the commissary, which equates to a net loss in an already meager salary. Um, for the civilians out there, when the, when the government decides to balance its budget through a thing called sequestration, we sort of write it off and say, hey, you know, they're, they're told to take a day off. I will tell you at the GS3 to the GS7 level, if you are told to take a day off every week, that's 20% of your salary gone. If any of you remember what it was like to struggle when you were younger and try to go ahead and pay for food and gas, let alone your housing, and then realize you're gonna do it with 20% less money, wake up, it ain't an easy thing to do. Finally, when I look at the mission, the, the fort was given the mission, and they can't really come out and talk about it the same way, of potentially reducing their staff by 3,100. What does 3,100 mean? It means they have got 10 basic training battalions out there. Those 10 basic training battalions bring in about $3 billion a year to this community. Think about that. $3 billion with a B. If you cut half the personality, it just doesn't mean you cut half of the basic training mission out there. It doesn't mean that you can just cut it in half because you've got, as you know in the business world, fixed and variable costs. The fixed cost is going to be, you know, you've got to, you've got to have a commanding general. You've got to have certain people are doing logistics. And it doesn't matter how many people you've got, that's the fixed cost. The variable cost is the amount of soldiers you train. Mathematically, the worst case scenario is you now drop to three battalions out of the nine or ten that are there at any given point in time, and that means to you here a loss of about two billion dollars. The multiplicative impact of a loss of two billion dollars just manufactures or, or increases substantially if you're not careful. Think about what impact the, you know, the, the troops have in your business. When they come into the airport every week, Okay, uh, you don't even know who they are. You know who the soldiers are, the brand new ones. They're carrying those manila folders. The moms and the dads and everybody else. The Chamber of Commerce put together a, uh, a study. It said that for every graduate, for every graduate, they bring in five and a half people. They train 50,000 people a year. That is 1,000 a week. That is five and a half thousand people coming to this community to spend their money at unprecedented levels because they feel guilty about leaving their kid, those kids with those evil drill sergeants. <laughs> okay? And so what happens if that goes away? Well, there's one organization that's allowed to lobby. We don't have a union in the Army. You're not allowed to have a union. That's good. You shouldn't have a union in, 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 in that kind of environment. But you have to have somebody that fights for the soldiers, fights for the community. At one point in time, AUSA had 239 corporate members. Today, we have got, uh, we went from a low 39 at the beginning of the fall to right now 52. But if you're trying to ask the Army where they're going to take their losses as they're directed to be reduced in strength, it's going to be to those, uh, those, uh, those communities that demonstrate that they've got skin in the game. If you don't think other communities are fighting for the mission here from Fort Jackson, you're kidding yourself. Because it has the same impact on everybody else. So if you walk away from this mission, if you don't see it as important, and it's not important to you and the growth of this community, then somehow it's time to go back to school and, and relook a little bit about economics. We need your help. That organization, AUSA, needs your help. We'd love to have you as an active part of it, but if all it is is becoming a corporate member, that's important. We want to be able to say that we jump from, yeah, it's a matter, it's more than just a monitor. We are America's most uh, uh, we're called friendly military city. 
That's nice. Does it go beyond the bumper sticker and the logo, or does it mean commitment? We need you to join AUSA. Uh, Dan is going to, if you'll hold the hand up and you want a corporate membership or an individual membership, he'll give you one. But we want you to be a member. If you got questions about it, call me. I'll talk to you any time of the day or night about AUSA and about protecting Columbia, protecting the state, and protecting, more importantly, our soldiers and their families. So I appreciate the, the few minutes that you gave me. Thank you very much, Kevin. We appreciate your being here today and all of the important work that you're doing on behalf of, of Fort Jackson and our military community. My name is Will Johnson. I'm an attorney on the economic development team at Hainsworth Sinclair Boyd, and I'm the immediate past chair of the Leadership Columbia Alumni Association. I can't think of a more appropriate person to speak to the Leadership Columbia Alumni Association than Columbia's city manager, and I'm very pleased today that we have Teresa Wilson to do just that. Teresa was originally planning to be with us next month, and so we're particularly grateful that she was willing to rearrange her schedule to accommodate a conflict uh, for Tally Parham Casey. Uh, we're also happy that, that Tally will be with us uh, next month, and so, uh, so we'll be right back on track. Uh, prior to becoming Columbia's chief executive, Teresa served as the government and community relations coordinator for the University of South Carolina's Office of the President. Uh, for the City of Columbia, she has served as the chief lobbyist and the director of governmental affairs, as well as the assistant city manager for community programs, economic development, and government services. Teresa has received numerous accolades, including being named one of Columbia's 20 under 40, uh, Columbia Business Monthly's 50 Most Influential People in 2011, and most recently, Southeast Small Business Magazine's Top Women of Influence. Um, when I asked for a headshot of Teresa from her, her very capable senior executive assistant, Ashley Jenkins, who's also here with us today, I got a digital photo that was named Teresa Wilson in Blue Blazer. Um, so I must say that I've been somewhat intrigued to know how many options there were. Um, <laughs> And what it is about our group that says we're the in blue blazer um, option, but perhaps we'll find out uh, during her remarks. Please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, Teresa Wilson. Just like I'm sure many of you have 
Um, I can honestly say, and ironically, as I'm helping to do my part to lead the city, I don't know that I've seen um, the gangbusters growth, the, the tremendous amount of growth and development um, that I've seen in, in such a short period of time that I anticipate, um, and we've got the facts behind that, will continue for the next several years. And so that creates a lot of opportunity for all of you here in this room to contribute. And what I want to do today is have actually more of a dialogue. Um, Ashley's going to help drive the PowerPoint for me and talk with you a lot about how, as the manager, I have um, quickly learned it's very incumbent uh, upon me to know my role and know that good governance in the city of Columbia means working in that gap with our elected officials and senior administration and all of the staff of the city to know what sometimes is politically acceptable and recognize that, but also to know what's administratively possible and palatable to give the best recommendations possible, um, competent, um, proactive, ethical leadership and recommendations that our policymakers can stand behind. Um, we have a wonderful mayor and council who are quite visionary and entrepreneurial and want to do things fast and quick and great things that we see happening around us. Um, I love it. I mean, I could, it could be a better time to be in this role. With that said, as a manager, you know, you don't rest well at night unless you know that you're giving good recommendations on how to get those things done. And it doesn't happen uh, inexpensively, does it, Michael Susan, our farm attorney over there? Um, one of many. Um, and it doesn't happen without knowing that you have uh, tried to dot every I and cross every T you can to make sure we're doing things right and we can, we can stand behind those things and sleep well at night for the effort we put in. So, at a glance, we're dealing at the city of Columbia with a budget that's well over $300 million when you look at all of the various funds. And I wanted to just give this basic information because for many of you all in your various roles throughout our community, this is good information to have. And I won't go through every line there, but if I were to add probably another $20 million in capital, and you're up to about a $330 million budget at the city of Columbia. This is our operating budget. And um, it, it is something that we work with the chamber and SCANA and many other of our big stakeholders in our community, Blue Cross and Colonial, all of them I see represented in this room. Um, because a lot of the things that we appropriate funding for, because we are um, a, a municipal government that has as a big resource, probably our biggest resource, our human capital. We have to make sure that um, not only for the citizens of Columbia, but for the employees that, that we have, um, we are making sure that those budgets and all of our department heads are paying particular attention to the bottom line. As our city council has um, set forth quite an aggressive agenda of things that they want to accomplish over the next several years. I know y'all will hear more about some of those things tonight when Mayor Benjamin presents the state of the city. It became um, obvious to me and our executive management team that we need to have a model that we can follow, that we can stand behind to make sure that we are implementing the policy that they so direct. So for a manager, and, and you know, I'm kind of a student of the profession, and I've gotten very engaged with the International City and County Management Association to become a credential manager, hopefully soon. One of the things that we're taught is that you have to, again, always work in that gap. I'm not the political figure, don't desire to be. You have to be careful not to um, bind yourself, as I tell my staff, um, falling into, uh, out of the gap and into the political side of things. Your purpose and our purpose is to deal with the facts, to provide the recommendations, to provide good customer service and customer care. A, one way for me to do that, I found, is to work with my staff across the, across the city and try to be more lean and streamlined in our approaches. 
uh, to make sure that we are being a business friendly government, that we are looking at how to do things better. The chamber has been um, a big part of that with a business friendly task force that was implemented uh, last year. I think we're at the point now, Carl, that you just give a report on finishing that up. And so there's a lot of good things that came out of that. And it's all in line with the Bill of Columbia model that you'll often see me discuss. You'll see our logo on everything. And I won't go through um, all of the bullets there, but it really is about eliminating you know, non-value added activities throughout our city and looking to do things uh, to redirect to higher priority activities and how we can make sure we're doing things efficiently and effectively. Three areas that we hear a lot about and just as a citizen, whether it's just residential or through your business, you know, you see us make utility cut repairs. Well, we do that, and sometimes there's a disconnect on if that water line got fixed, when's someone gonna come back out and clean up my yard or clean up my street? That's a very simple thing, but it means a lot to the average everyday citizen. So we're looking at why, what's the disconnect? Why is that taking so long? Or, you know, what are the problems there? So that was one of the areas we focused on, utility cut repairs. Actually going really fast. <laughs> the other one is uh, building permit processes and of course IT technology software deployment. So those are just a hint of some of the things we're looking at doing through the Bill Columbia model, very specific things. Um, customer care, of course, is also high on that priority list as well. Okay. Um, the Bill Columbia model has some highlights from this year. Again, these are mostly things that City Council has identified um, through our strategic plan and, and otherwise as priorities. And I'm just going to fly through some of these. They're all listed here. We're going to do a slide on each one of them. And what we try to do with each policy initiative that council has for us is again try to fall back on the Bill of Columbia initiative. It's taking some education with our staff. You know, it, I'm talking to them more like running a city as a business. So our front office staff, the people that work with the public and talk to the public every day, and then our operational staff that's the back office and make sure that we're doing things appropriately and following the model. Um, so that, you know, it's a little new to the staff, but it's okay because, um, again, we are asked and tasked with much, so we're going to have to find ways to get it done and get it done efficiently. So actually, we can go to the Infinite Weather Center partnership. Many of you have heard in the news this year about our homeless um, population and making sure that as a city that we are doing the most humanitarian approach that we can to deal with our homeless population. At the same time, there's a balance that has to be struck with doing that. And if the city is the right um, entity to handle everything that goes along with that, and I would say to you, no, it is not. Um, there are many service providers in our community who are much more equipped we know how to deal with the myriad of issues that are associated with the homeless population from mental health issues and, and very big, um, big topics that city staff, I mean, that's not what we do. We are and should be a conduit to get that done and, and make sure that there's infrastructure in place to assist. And so for the first time, I think, really this year, there was a sea change on our council to acknowledge what should our role really be. And what we came up with was um, an, an RFP process where we now have the United Way of the Midlands working as our homeless coordinator, which entails dealing with all the various issues, pulling in the right people who know and are um, expert, experts in the field. And part of that, we have the partnership with Transitions and Salvation Army to operate our Inclement Weather Center. Thus far, it's been going very well. Um, we have on um, every day, we have a, a, a great group of people who make a decision by 12 noon, should the Inclement Weather Center be open, they stop the temperature of 40 degrees, um, that they've looked at and planned out, and if, and if that's the case for that evening, then we're open. And we have the right people there to staff the facility. And so far, so good. It is a different model than in the past when we had a 
uh, homeless shelter operating by the city 24-7 this past year with the help of Christ Central, who we were very thankful for that partnership. But at the same time, um, we want to continue to look at this and make sure that you know we have that right balance. So that's one of the things you've heard about this year. Um, we are also, of course, experiencing a lot of growth and development that we mentioned on the riverfront. I'm sure many of you are aware of the, the apartment complex planned adjacent to the McDonald's in the Vista, um, the Klein Center project. They're excited about a $100 million investment there. The now sign is expanding to 400 units with a $20 million investment. And we're just seeing a huge growth in the Vista. 3,000 3, people living at Hugie and Blossom. Um, projected with another 3,000 living near the river. The bicycle pedestrian friendly model that I know many of you, I don't, I think I heard a whimper that this class of 2015 had suggested, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that we, that you all wanted to do something in line with what the city's doing. So we're all for that. Let us know <laughs> how you want to help us out with this. But this is so exciting. Um, when the Urban Land Institute came in and did reality check, a lot of what we heard um, was about as this city continues to develop, people want to be out, about with their families, and utilizing our natural resources. But of course, we want people to be safe and be able to do that um, with uh, the right infrastructure. And so. We are looking at additions to the Three Rivers Greenway um, with through the Penny sales tax for Richland County. We'll be completing um, an additional segment of the Greenway from Taylor Street all the way to Elmwood Avenue, and then it will continue on thereafter. And then, of course, we've partnered with the Central Midlands Council of Governments to develop a pedestrian and bicycle master plan and a bike share plan, which is also in conjunction with the University of South Carolina called uh, Walk by Columbia. So again, if the, bill, if the leadership class for this year wants to get involved, please let us know. Um, the city has several component units. Um, they have in the past done, you know, lots of things because the city has an empowerment zone where some federal dollars have flowed through. Um, and I won't get into the weeds about how you determine if if you're if you are part of that empowerment zone, but one of the things that we've been able to do to leverage some of that federal funding that comes through with the Columbia Empowerment Zone in particular um, is to look at um, purchasing facilities, how do we utilize those throughout our community, and particularly with businesses this year, the Empowerment Zone, which has they all have their own boards, these component units and development corporations, but they were able to cut the ribbon for a new multi-tenant building, Lady Street Suites, which is located in 1509 Lady Street. And what we're hoping is almost like an incubator um, where businesses that are small and growing need um, office space, but you know, not they're not ready to quite have their own storefront. And it we're you know we're fully booked already. I mean they are we're at get requests every day for people to have an opportunity to go in that facility. Eau Claire Development Corporation also previewed three new homes in the Burton Heights neighborhood. Um, Northern Columbia is looking to grow and expand off the Barrow Road area. And so this has been a, a great asset for that area to get um, families to look at purchasing homes out there. It's right off 77, good distance from downtown Columbia. Growth and development, again, um, you, I'm going to not delve too much into these. I can promise you, you will hear more about them tonight from Mayor Benjamin. But over a billion dollars in investment since 2011, including only major projects in that $1 billion number, um, of, of that are over a billion dollars are in that $1 billion number. But we've got 42 projects um, that are significant under instruction already and some um, that are about to be announced. It doesn't even include the Bull Street or Spirit Communications Park, and the residential capacity in Class A office space occupancy is over 90%. Now that's a great stat to say, at the same time, that's we're over 90%, so we, we are well aware that we've gotta do something about that. I'm sure many people in this room are, are involved in the commercial and residential um, development. 
One of the things that has been important to me, and I know it's important to our council, and particularly, um, I would say, districts one and two, while we're seeing all of this unprecedented growth and development, many times in the entertainment districts and Main Street and downtown, we don't want our everyday citizens who have quality of life issues to feel that that is going unnoticed. So one of the things that I've tried to do in working with Chief Holbrook, our zoning officials and others, is to realign code enforcement. Code enforcement is now a function of the Columbia Police Department. That's a model that's done across the country and I thought that it was the time for us to try that. Sometimes just the fact that it's, a, it's the police and that it's associated with the police department does something when you go to um, absentee landlords or tenants who are not doing what they're supposed to do and there's a little more teeth there um, or at least it comes across that way and we're seeing some good results with this so far so what we're trying to do is identify certain um, communities where the quality of life calls for service are extremely high and target those areas for 30, 60, 90 day periods of time and just stay in there, going door to door, literally every house with our code enforcement officials backed up by the police to um, make some changes and get people to understand that they've got to attend to their property. Now with that said, you often have elderly residents, they can't afford to do certain things right then. So it's not, you know, the big bad city coming down on folks that can't afford to do what they need to do, but it is us trying to get them the resources that they need and the folks who can do what they're supposed to do, the expectation is that they do that. Um, we've got a lot of great nightlife and venues and vibrant entertainment going on. How many of you went to famously hot New Year this year? Good, Susan's back right there. <laughs> up high. Good. I mean, it's really grown over the past several years. Um, I told Sam Johnson, who, um, you know, Sam is uh, sometimes like a little brother to me, so I have to get on him. He's the mayor's assistant. And he does a great job, but, you know, he came from a world of um, being on campaign trail. And so I can honestly say over the last several years, he has grown and matured and had to learn the processes of city government and how we have to get things done. He, would, he knows I just say this all the time, so he would be <laughs> um, But I do, I am glad to hear that this year they were, you know, within budget and those types of things because as much as we want to have these wonderful venues and entertainment, we got to do it right and be accountable and transparent to the citizens of Columbia on how we're getting paid for. And so they did an exceptional job. It's grown and have a great committee who works on that event. Um, Main Street Ice Skating Rink is another great city, um, a, um, I guess, a venue for families. And we've noticed that families are asking for it every year. So we're excited about being able to offer it. The Music Farm at Tim Roof. I haven't been there yet. Has anybody been there? Okay. Good. And Hickory Tavern, I haven't been there either. I heard it's an exceptional restaurant that, um, off Senate Street. Bourbon, of course, um, I could, you know, name so many. I mean, it's just amazing at right now how many wonderful establishments we have for people, particularly when they're coming into Columbia looking for entertainment and uh, um, somewhere to go out. The exceptional college sporting events featuring nationally ranked teams, Lady Gamecocks. I mean, what do you say? I'm so excited about them. <laughs> um, we have uh, created attracting the local communities. Uh, again, the State Museum expansion is so exciting. I highly recommend uh, going to the planetarium and the 4D theater, recruitment of uh, Whole Foods, DSW, Trader Joe's, Home Goods, and there's some others I cannot name at this time, but y'all are gonna be really excited, really excited. There are these letters of intent that I'm sure you've heard about with uh, uh, out at Bull Street. It, it's, going to be amazing. Palmetto Health Park Ridge Hospital completed a $125 million facility, $225,000 square, uh, square feet on a 77-acre campus. I live in Northwest Columbia and I was out there recently. 
So I walk in and there was like this waterfall coming down in the lobby and I'm like, what is this in the hospital? There's this wellness spa. I'm like, okay, never heard of that. But it honestly is, um, you know, more than just a normal spa. It is for health and wellness and it's just, exceptional. Everyone needs to at least go see that facility, that campus. And of course we're very proud of all that Agape Senior has invested in our downtown, renovating three Main Street buildings for their new corporate headquarters. I think I go to Michael's how many times a week actually for my breakfast? Oh, three or four times a week. Yeah. Um, the Bull Street, I mentioned a redevelopment project entertainment venue. It's very exciting. I know Carl was they're recently breaking ground with the mayor on the uh, on the ballpark, Spirit Communications Park, and we look to very very soon uh, name that team. Um, some great names that are being thrown around on that, and then the multi-use entertainment venue, of course, is just one component of that project. And um, I anticipate that we'll hear more announcements here very shortly. So city services and our transportation grant we just got, the facade program, which I know many of you have heard about where we're leveraging funds. No, the city, even with the big budget that I showed you, it is very hard, y'all, to keep that balanced and stay within budget and do all that we're doing without leveraging federal dollars or grants. And so we have a dedicated team who looks every day at uh, grant funds thank god we do because the tiger grant that's mentioned here it took us three times to get that grant we applied for it and the third time was the charm so we're going to keep doing that because it's worth the effort um, but we're investing about 500 million dollars a year to expand and improve our water and sewer infrastructure um, you all be hearing more about that in the weeks to come um, we have a crane creek um, interceptor that we are about to put to bid and get done for on the northeast side of town. I have every um, belief that it will get done and, and we will continue to expand and, and hope for lots of great developments on the northeast side of town. The city to receive, um, again, the Tiger grant, we've gotten it, and the um, money that the penny tax already had allocated for North Main is going to be um, leveraged with that $10 million to get North Main Street done. So it will be done um, as soon as we can get the rest of it bid. We're looking at the Main Street Capital Program to create um, even more energy on Main Street, offering up to $50,000 for new businesses locating to Main Street proper. Um, these uh, grant funds we've noticed with the facade and then this program really seem to spur investment. Um, people like the fact that they have this opportunity for a very low interest or forgivable loan um, to, to get started. And so that's working well. Other programs like our Work It Up program and our Business in Motion, we've had those for a while and we're continuing to see good results with those as well as our mentor protege programs and our local business enterprise programs um, policy. Very excited about the excellence in financial reporting. Um, I hate that our CFO is not here and all of the team that's shown there because they have worked really hard. Um, in 07, 08, just like everybody else, the city was facing some dire financial um, crises and we got through it with the help of the former city manager and the team at that time. Um, we are now in a position, we think, to maintain and sustain the hard work that was put in for the first time since 2005. The city received the um, Excellence in Financial Reporting or Certificate of Achievement, um, and that's really the highest form of recognition in the area of governmental accounting and financial reporting. I'm very proud of that fact. I mean, it speaks for itself. Um, our CAFR is, is um, responsive and transparent, and people understand it and I knew when I became manager that was probably the first thing I tell the story all the time that I did um, probably within a week was to get a CFO who is um, top-notch um, not only is he ha does he have the technical expertise but he is a people person and so he is able to talk 
the very sophisticated uh, financial language in a way that our department heads recognize and understand, and that's really key when you find that person. It's hard to find that type of person as well. Um, you know, I'm not going to get into the other thing that I'm thankful for um, is that we got who I believe to be the very best police chief we could have found um, in William Skip Holbrook. He was sworn in on um, or introduced on March 21st and his you know, hit the ground run. He would tell you it's lots of balls to juggle and he's still doing that, but I have only received good feedback. There will be challenging days. Um, you can't call it when you're managing people. People make mistakes. Um, they make mistakes in judgment. We had one this week. Um, but it's how we deal with it and how swiftly we deal with it and how we self-correct. And I don't worry about the self-correction probably like I did before. And that's just a fact. He is, um, he's just a good person. And I think he has, um, first and foremost, the welfare of this city as his top priority. And I can say that unequivocally. Um, he's launched a major recruitment and retention initiative at, that allows our PD to hire up. Um, we have got to fill 45 vacancies. That's almost a region. And we have to do it. And as hard as it is to make decisions that are specific to one area of the city over another, if people don't feel safe, you know, that affects everything. The economics, the businesses, the commercial investment. So that is why we have stepped out on a limb and um, we're offering a 7% pay increase to our officers. We're offering them opportunities to educationally advance, um, offering them opportunities to advance in the department in other areas, whether it's criminal investigations um, or field training. So we're hopeful within the next year, year or two that he will have achieved um, a fully staffed department. The Philly Park Master Plan. Philly Park is one of our greatest natural assets downtown Columbia. It needs an overhaul. We recognize that. Um, it's going to take a lot of money to do it, but I do think that council um, will invest strategically in a phased approach until we get this done. So we've started the process with charrettes and public meetings and opportunities for the community to tell us what they want, what they're looking for. And we hope you all get involved with that as well. And I think finally, the downtown residen residential boom, which I've really already mentioned. Um, I have never quite seen the interplay and interaction between uh, young college students and the business community <laughs> on Main Street like I have but since the hub opened. Um, it is a, a great um, asset to our downtown. Um, it creates creating a little bit of a different mix with the mopeds and young ladies early in the morning. And anyway, we're <laughs> <laughs> we're, um, we're we're working through all those issues, but it's well worth working through them. Um, we are excited about you know the fact that it brings moms and dads and that means they're going to go out to dinner and enjoy Main Street and game weekends and all of those things but at the as Jerry Brewer sits back there he knows we've had the conversations about no jokes aside we want them to be safe and um, we are, have worked with the university and all the surrounding colleges and universities to ensure that whatever we can do to educate our young people um, about all that comes with living downtown, um, you know, we, we're going to continue to do that. But it's a great facility. And, you know, I don't know how I'm going to pay for my child to live somewhere when it's time for her to go to college because it ain't, I mean, that's, you yeah, had been in there. Y'all can take a look at how they're living over there at the home. <laughs> Five major student housing projects are also currently in development. The five projects will bring an additional 3,500 downtown within the next two years. Another 1,000, over 1,000 beds of capacity are in development with smaller projects. So, that's a lot. And I only really touched on each of those things, and there's lots more. Um, I couldn't be more honored and excited about um, assisting the council and managing the city of Columbia 
It's a great place to live, work and play. And whatever you all can do to um, offer encouragement, um, critiques, suggestions, please send them our way because we're very um, open to the communication and really want to, um, you know, take advantage of all of this good talent in this room. So thank you for having me. And if you have any questions, I always try to leave time for some dialogue. <laughs> I knew it will. <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit about the, the riverfront development in addition to the private developments that are going in? Is there is there hope that we'll have a sort of big you know, public park, public space, you know, great place for community members to go along the river in the mm -hmm. future? There is that hope. Um, I, you know, that's a, a planned project. Um, it is really the university's project. Um, and the Ginyard family, and there's a lot of, um, I guess, negotiations too that may still have to occur. But I do think that the Sasaki plan, or as it was originally intended, it had it, that is part of that design to get to the riverfront. And I do think that with the penny now, we're we're seeing a lot of opportunity to leverage those funds. So you're going to see that Green Street connector being completed. Um, the, the, the city is very involved with that as well. And I think it's just going to have to happen in phases. And, and the, the part specifically that you're asking about is probably still a little ways off from all indications that I have. Um, again, the university, Jerry, I don't know if you know any more about that, but um, that, that's the only information I would have on the part specifically at this point. You know, the, the city, I will say, and some of their, um, the council, when we make trips and talk to the to our federal delegation, that has always made, been a, a priority on their list because there's you know some federal funds that can help with that as well. Baseball's coming to Columbia. When did you say the team would be announced? <clears throat> that is a question for the owner. I do think that he is getting closer. Um, I met with him last week and he was talking names. So that was some indication to me that they, they're getting close. Yes, sir. Well, a couple of things you've got to deal with, obviously, is the homeless population. And you've said that you know, you've basically thrown the ball into the court of the United Way transition for the Salvation Army. Well, I was correct. Um, what is the, the, the city's role in that in terms of funding, staffing, and, uh, and, you know, and ensuring it's just not a hospital pass yeah, to the sure. Well, again, we think that the city's role is to be a conduit for funding. Um, obviously, the funding is limited, and I think that was part of the council's decision-making process is the funding that we did have available this year, how could it be put to its best use? Um, I know that there are still conversations underway regarding um, a permanent facility um, that is close enough, I guess, to downtown that the individuals who need to be served can get to the service providers. That's always a concern because most of the service providers are in the downtown area. Um, but for right now, the way that the city has defined its role is to hire a coordinator of services that will look at um, food sharing, for example, as we are trying to you know, get Finley Park to where it needs to be, the reality is you got to strike that balance. You know, there's not, sometimes a weekend that goes by where I don't get a call from a young family who's trying to enjoy the park, but at the same time, we got um, a food sharing going on in the park. And, you know, humanitarian, from the humanitarian side of things and ministries that are out there, we don't want to discourage that. We're just saying we got to do it in the right places at the right times and have the folks who are experts in helping coordinate that help us do that. The city will always have a role, any city our size and smaller. I mean, you're gonna have a homeless population. So we're not saying that the city doesn't have a role to play. I think we're just looking to leverage resources at this point, provide funding that will assist with that coordination of the effort. Um, so I don't know if I answer your question, but that is the role that we're playing. It's more of a conduit for all of that to occur 
applying funding for that to occur. And if, in fact, um, the emergency shelter that we have has to become utilized um, in a bigger way, then we're probably open to that as well. Then we're doing it again this year. I could have repurposed those buildings. The original directive was to repurpose those buildings for city internal needs. And we didn't do that. We're using it for the Inclement Weather Center. Other questions? Let's go to Rosanna. As a token of our mm -hmm. thanks and gratitude for you being with us today, we have a gift from Thank the Leadership you. Columbia alumni. One of my favorite places. <laughs> Thank from you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Another round of applause for Teresa Wilson. We ask you guys to join us uh, for our next leadership luncheon, which will be on February 17th. Our uh, keynote speaker will be Tally Parham Casey, an attorney with the White Law Firm and South Carolina's first female fighter pilot. Uh, registration for that luncheon will begin soon. Check your emails for the opportunity to uh, register for that and share it with your friends. We'd love to have visitors as well. So now it's time for door prizes. Are we missing any business cards for the door prizes? All right, you guys have been trained well. All right, first up, for our first door prize, a Starbucks gift card. Starbucks is currently introducing the perfect balance between bold ristretto shot and creamy steamed milk with their new flat white drink. <laughs> Starbucks did not pay for this uh, announcement or they would have hired better talent. Uh, <laughs> An extra ristretto shot ensures that it's bolder than a latte, yet steamed milk keeps it smoother than a cappuccino. <laughs> and the lucky winner, Eric Dickey. Thank you. Oh, good one, I know, yay. Our second door prize is two guest passes to Historic Columbia. On February 1st, Historic Columbia begins featuring home places, work, workplaces, and resting places, an African-American heritage site tour. From the Man Simons site, home of Celia Mann, to the North Carolina Mutual Building, offices of the largest African-American owned life insurance company in the United States, this tour explores houses, businesses, cemeteries, and other sites important to the African-American community. And the lucky winner is Lindsey Griffin. We can, re we can redraw that one. She, she's already going. <laughs> Rachel Livingston Popkowski. If the next one's not here, I'm taking it. <laughs> Angela Ruiz. Yay, great. I'll leave it right here. You can get it up. And last but not least, our final door prize is four passes to the Columbia Museum of Art. The museum is currently featuring Columbia Now, Four Photographers Show Us Our City, an exhibition highlighting our hometown as interpreted through photographs by four local photographers. Columbia Now is a selection of 24 photographs by Vinnie Dees Moore, Robert Clark, Elliot Dudick, and Mike Griffiths that paint a portrait of a city. The works form an up-to-the-minute document about the city of Columbia, including snippets of residents as well as landscape and architecture. Columbia Now is part of a citywide marking of the 150th anniversary of the burning in Columbia. And the winner is Justine Jones. I'll have this up here for you as well. 
All right, well, thank you guys so much for joining us for uh, the luncheon series, picking up now at the beginning of the year. We do have the next luncheon on the 17th. Remember that your challenge is to give back to your community. Uh, this is an extension of your Leadership Columbia experience, and we hope that you will find ways that you can get more involved with the Leadership Columbia Alumni Association and with the great partners that we have that come and speak to us and talk about their groups. So we'll see you on the 17th, and thank you so much.